Good evening, everybody. Hope you're all doing well and staying out of trouble. It's good to be able to join you and, and help inaugurate this new lecture series on angels, which I will begin in short order as I pull up my notes and everything else. And everything might look a bit rickety, but that's quite frankly because it is. Hopefully not the lecture, though. But certainly this has seen better days. Putting it to good use. So for the next five weeks, skipping one in, in the middle, we'll be looking at angels, guardian angels, demons, archangels, and lastly, to take a look at the role, the unique role that angels have in the liturgy itself. It's quite an interesting thing. And Father John Paul, Father Joachim and I really thought this through and thought this could well be worth pursuing. So. Seeing as how people have begun to kind of file in, why don't we start with a prayer and go from there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, who sent your angel to protect Peter while he laid in prison, we ask that on this feast day of the Apostle Peter and of St. Paul, that you may enlighten our minds and direct our hearts to love you aright, that through the ministry of the angels we may come to a still deeper knowledge and abiding love of you amidst whatever trials we may happen to face. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord, and we pray as he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lady, Queen of the Angels, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, tonight my lecture is going to be given by paper, and so you might wonder why the laptop is here. Am I trying to sneak in a football game or something? No. It's that there was meant to be an audio-visual component to all of this, which I tried to get to work in my office and failed miserably. We're not formed to be able to do podcasts, and I apologize, but please bear with me. I'm going to try to make this as interactive and helpful as I can, and you'll, you'll see. You'll see what I'm talking about when it comes. So, there's a bit of a bait-and-switch here, like in many a Dominican talk. Often, the bait-and-switch is promising you won't talk about Thomas, and then you end up talking about St. Thomas Aquinas, but tonight, it's in the very title of the talk. The talk was Angels their nature and their role, I believe it is, right? Or who they are and what they do for us, something like that. But I'm actually going to flip it around. It's going to be angels, what they do, and who they are. Because it's a lot easier to see what they do than to come to a knowledge of who they are, apart from what we know through revelation and tradition. So I want to focus on what we can know more easily and readily, and then go to what takes a little more reflection and thought. So a bit of a bait and switch for you. I'm sure you're fine. And if you're not, well, this lecture is free. So, you know, ask for a refund. So, St. Gregory the Great, when he discusses the question of angels, this is a reading that's read every year on the feast of, I believe, the guardian angels, speaks how angel doesn't denote a nature, but an office. That is, when you say angel, you're not so much talking about a particular type of creature directly, Rather, you're talking about a particular role that a creature, or presumably any creature, might exercise. This is weird, I think, to our expectation, because when you say to your kid, draw me an angel, they'll whip out a crayon, depending on the age, or maybe a marker if they're a bit older, or what have you, and immediately the wings will come, and there'll probably be a smile, and you'll get an angel pretty quickly. So, we all seem to have a picture of what angels are, and yet, the testimony and emphasis of this doctor of the church is the very opposite. It's on what angels do. And in making this claim, St. Gregory is going back to the very word angel itself. Angel comes, it sounds like a, an exalted and mystical word, but it's actually a pretty ordinary one. It simply means messenger, messenger in Greek, angelos. And you could say, well, God didn't speak first in Greek, he spoke in Hebrew. Okay, malach. Same term. It's, it's the same concept, whether in the Hebrew or the Greek. To be an angel means to be a messenger. 
And this means that it could be a lot more wide-ranging than you would expect. Any courier could be called an angel. Maybe not so much in the Bible itself, but in other Greek and Hebrew literature, certainly. We even have a concept of Christ serving as an angel, not because we claim him to be a created spiritual creature, but because he is the angel of great counsel, foretold by Isaiah. He's the one who brings the message of peace. He is a messenger from the Father in a true sense, just as he calls himself a prophet, even though he is far more than a prophet. So again, the role is just that, a role, and the term is just that, a term to apply to the role. Okay, Father, so, so we can stop here? Nope, sorry, you didn't get off that easy. So there are a few conventions that I think are worth pointing out. One of the first is that it doesn't even always mean messenger in the way that we would expect. Again, though this is the foundational understanding of angel as messenger, or um, malak, angelos or malak, you know, Hebrew or Greek, as messenger, there are certain conventions that point to a deeper and particular understanding that Revelation wants to have for us. And so in the earliest books of the Hebrew Old Testament, particularly in the Torah, we have a sense of what's called the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord isn't just God's favorite angel, okay? The angel of the Lord is rather a way of describing God's presence in a way without simply saying, oh, he's here. Because remember the emphasis and the difficulty of ancient Israel. They want to express God's presence to his people, his readiness to hear their prayers, his accessibility in the face of their needs, and his responsiveness in the face of their needs, but also that he's entirely transcendent. He's not one of the Greek gods who, who carries on like a degenerate frat boy or gets involved in various circumstances. Rather, he is and remains a god who is beyond, who is beyond the ordinary experience. And so this term, angel of the Lord, is often used in that context. So, you could see, for instance... In Genesis 16, 7, an angel of the Lord addresses Hagar, who's crying at the well, sorely oppressed and running away from her mistress, Sarah. Now, Hagar, you may remember, you may not, was a, a slave girl that served her wife of Abraham, and there was some domestic dispute and unrest. I covered it in my Bible study about a month and a half ago. Not that that's really going to help you at this point, but just to say that the idea is that God addresses Hagar as she's weeping in isolation, looking at this problem. And it doesn't want to say that God goes up to her the way like a high school principal might walk up to a, a teenager crying in a high school hallway. God's a bit beyond that. But his angel is there. His messenger is there. And again, this is not intended to mean that there's a particular angel spiritual creature sent. It's rather a divine manifestation, a manifestation of God's presence, but still not the totality of who he is. It's an, a way to make sure that we don't get tripped up and think, oh, that's, that's what God is. God is like that, that thing that kind of pumps up, like pops out like Rumpelstiltskin. No, no. The point of angel of the Lord is to say just the opposite, that God can appear to us, but he is far more than any appearance he might assume. See, so that's one example. Another, this is where you can kind of see it um, a bit more clearly, what I'm kind of talking about here. Abraham's getting ready to sacrifice his son Isaac in Genesis 22. And just as he's pulling the knife and having promised his son that God will provide the sacrifice, it's not God that speaks from heaven. It's an angel of the Lord that speaks from heaven. So here, it's not even God's divine presence in Abraham's midst. It's a voice from heaven, but again, it doesn't want to, the text and the writer do not want to assert that God's just shouting from up top, like some parent shouting down at a, at a kid living in the basement, hey, turn it down, or hey, cut it out. There's an emphasis here on the angel of the Lord to provide a sense of distance and mystery in the face of what's going on. Perhaps one of the most bracing examples of all this, you may remember, is Exodus chapter 3, the burning bush where an angel of the Lord is in the fire. The idea is, then, that God is present in a unique way as the, the bush is burning and yet not consumed. And yet, 
this isn't just a natural phenomenon. This isn't just a natural God. This is a God who exists far beyond the terms of the bush, of the fire, of Moses' experience. And yet, the angel of the Lord, as a literary device in this case, makes clear that transcendent God's presence and influence in that situation. Now, I already promised you one bait and switch, and I just gave you another, so I apologize. <laughs> We're still not talking about creaturely angels, are we? And that's what you're here for. You saw the nice flyer of Our Lady cradling the Christ child and a host of angels on either side, all of them staring at you. And that's what you came for. And don't worry, that's what you're going to get. But I bring these up because whenever we read the scriptures, we have to be careful to read them in accord with the genre, in accord with the conventions of their time, so that we might not be misled from what happens. And this term, the angel of the Lord, used in this way, is found throughout many of the early books, whether Judges or Joshua. This understanding is a very strong one. And yet it's not the only one. Of course, there is the understanding that we conventionally have, not of Hallmark card angels with beautiful wings that look like little cherubic children, but angels as spiritual creatures, that's a common enough picture, and that's what we're getting to now. Some look at the development of the term angel in the scriptures, again, the earlier term of angel of the Lord to show God's transcendence, moving slowly into an understanding of angels sent by God. They see this as something that was prompted by history. It's not simply revelation. And so some will throw out the idea, say, that, you know, you had the Babylonian exile in the 6th century, in the 6th century BC, and Israel, Israel, Judah, was deported to Babylon by the, the Babylonians, and in encountering the Persians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, these Israelites picked up a notion of angels from these other cultures. That, in a sense, Israel was taught about angels by these other cultures that believed in a multiplicity of divine figures who warred with each other, including various minor figures who would resemble, if you squint enough, what we refer to as angels. And so you might see this line of argument in various places, that, oh, Judaism didn't have a lot of angels, and then they were deported to Babylon, and then they picked it up from the Persians. Now, this is a bit of a downside, right? Because it basically denies revelation. It's saying God didn't reveal this. Rather, these cultures did. On the other hand, we do have to acknowledge that many of the descriptions of angels are what we would call culturally conditioned. That doesn't mean that when we see, say, Ezekiel's description of angels as wheels of fire, when he talks about the cherubim in chapter 10 of the book of Ezekiel, many scholars have pointed out that the images resemble, to a great degree, what would have passed for, for Babylonian or Persian understandings of these spiritual creatures. Because it's made clear even there the divine transcendence beyond these creatures. These aren't just fellow citizens with God and the heavenly court. These are servile creatures that are majestic and powerful in their own right. And they resemble, to some degree, the, the contemporary descriptions from pagan sources. But while they share some of that language, and, and the Jewish thought of that time would, would register some of those concepts, even here there is something quite distinct in how the angels are portrayed. So we have to be able to understand, yes, yeah, some of Ezekiel's language, some of the language for the angels may have been picked up from, from Persian or Babylonian loan words. As you get to more recent books of the Bible, you see more Aramaic words, more loan words from other languages. As, say, you know, you read a book now in English, and it might have more Spanish words in it now than it would have 50 years ago, or, or more Italian words than it would have 80 years ago. There's a sense in which languages interact with each other and concepts interact with each other, and a book lit written 50 years later is going to have a very different vocabulary than one written 50 years earlier. And so we, too, have to be ready to see here that sort of thing. Not to the denial of divine revelation, but ready to see that people receive revelation in the mode of the receiver. They receive revelation in large part from the way they've been conditioned to think about the world, which comes at the invitation of God, of course, but also in parallel with their own sense and culture. So, again, <laughs> enough about not talking about angels. Let's get to it. So again, we have this idea of the angel of the Lord in the Torah, in Joshua, and Judges. And then we have this criticism that, oh, that was angel of the Lord, the ancient Jews, and then the Persianized Jews, the ones who encountered it um, in the exile, they kind of picked up the idea of angels. But we have references to angels 
from books and from stories that are pre-exilic, from times before the exile. In 2 Samuel 19, verse 27, someone compares Saul, who is still king at that point, but my lord the king is like the angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you. That is, you are God's messenger. You, you make the call. Saul would not have been directly compared to God in the mysterious divine presence. This is an angel of a more intermediary sort. 2 Samuel 24, verses 16 to 17. This is the account of David choosing a plague for the kingdom. You know, he enumerated the census to the displeasure of the Lord, and God tells him to pick a peril for his kingdom. And we might groan in the face of the, the plague we've undergone these past few months, but he picks a plague as well. And it's depicted at the agency of an angel. And when the angel stretched forth his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented of the evil and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Araunah the Jebusite. Then P P David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was smiting the people, and he said, Lo, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, my people, what have they done? Let thy hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. So you see here, David is ready to recognize and is insistent that this angel is someone to be restrained by God. Okay, one last one. This is from um, Second Kings. It's, it's Elijah, who, lay, who, fleeing from Ahab, lays down, ready to die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate the cake and drank the water and went in strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Sinai, the mountain of God. So here we have this sense then of Elijah responding to an angel. Now you could say, well, why couldn't this be the angel of the Lord from earlier scripture? Well, whenever people run into that angel, they get terrified. <laughs> they, they perk up. They don't think there was a widespread belief that one could not look upon the face of God and live. That God's experience, the experience of seeing God face to face, would be so overwhelming that one could not survive it. When Moses sees a vision of the Lord, it says afterward, and even after seeing the Lord, they could still eat and drink, as if this were a remarkable thing, that they were still in the body, still alive. So Elijah here takes it pretty well. He's a spiritual man, granted, one dedicated to fasting, but ready for this situation and, and ready to deal with this angel as a creature. Okay, let's keep going. So angels don't just drop into the story after the Jews meet the Persians, okay? And yet, angels do take more of a front and center stage in books like Ezekiel and Daniel. So I think we have to say there's a point to pointing out how interaction with other cultures may have more led to an awareness of angels or a more of a sensitivity towards their action in our world and a readiness to see them manifest themselves. But we also don't want to say that, oh, they just gleaned this from the Persians and made it up. Let's keep going. But how do we know angels exist? How would we know that angels exist from what we have? Well, in terms of philosophical argument, we don't have all that much um, proof of the fact that angels exist. And it is a fact. It's a fact of our faith. But think of why we wouldn't have a, a reason to prove that angels exist. We reason with our minds, granted, and we can reason with various abstract com concepts that are immaterial. But we generally learn by interacting with the material world, right? You want to check that your daughter's really sick when she wants to stay home from school and not faking it. You check for the fever. You feel for it, right? Or you get a thermometer, and then you look at it. You want to see that your pasta's done. It's al dente. You taste it. You, you want to get a sense of a book. You flip through it. You read it. You want to get a sense of whether this particular chair is something you'd want in your house. You feel the material. We interact with things. We interact with things on a material level. And most of what we come to know and understand, we do through reasoning from our senses. Angels are immaterial. They can manifest themselves in the material world, but they're not bound to. And so you can't, in a sense, find them anywhere, whether dancing on the head of a pen or hanging out at Club Med. You, you could go to Loch Ness and wait for a long time, and no angel need manifest himself, right? They're immaterial. No demon either. And so 
there's no physical demonstration we can do. There's no physical argumentation we can do. There's no gravitational field or wave or, or, or test that we can follow to find angels. You know, maybe if I have a Ghostbusters fanatic here, maybe they'll take some issue with the idea of detecting spirits. But the fact is that when we talk about angels, we're talking about purely immaterial spirits. And so you're kind of out of luck if you're hoping to find footsteps or traces or fossils of them, because it doesn't work that way. They're immaterial. But we do have a, an argument by reason of fittingness. Now, reasons of fittingness can be somewhat difficult to see, but let's just make this kind of clear. Say you're going down to New York for the day, right? And you ask yourself, well, how can I get there? You could charter a plane, right? You could cost a lot of money. Would it really save you that much time? You could maybe take a flight from Boston or, or maybe Hartford, but that would be more trouble than it's worth. You can see that fairly quickly. You could take the Metro North. You could drive your car. You could walk. Maybe there's some other option. Maybe you could try to ride a horse. Good luck with that. But the point is, as you look at these various ways of trying to get to New York, you can think of what would be most fitting and proper for the situation. And this is where arguments of fittingness really come in. An argument, you know, when you debate what way to get to New York, you're never going to come to a conclusive argument of this is the way. But you can come to an argument of, or a decision or a determination that this way would be the most cost effective, this way would be the quickest, this way seems to combine and address all the various factors I have in mind for my particular situation. So, you know, if you're in a wheelchair and the, the charter plane's wheelchair, not wheelchair accessible, that's probably not going to be a great option for you, odds are. Or if you don't have a lot of money, then you're probably going to have to walk. So you can see fittingness under different aspects for different reasons, right, depending on your priorities. So an argument for fittingness doesn't prove the thing is the case, but it does prove that given the circumstances, this would probably be the most likely option, right? You see that your husband only has 10 bucks in his bank account, and he's going down to New York to buy, I don't know, what would you buy in New York for $10? A, a milkshake. Why he went there? Well, what a fool he was. Chances are, though, he's not going on Metro North to get there if all he's got is 10 bucks. So you can tell from fittingness how something probably went, even if you can't actually demonstrate it is, in fact, the case. So back to angels. I know I'm not talking about angels, but hopefully I'm giving you enough context to get to them. So... How do we know that angels exist, or how do we know that it's fitting for angels to exist? In this way, that there seems to be a gradation of being, right? You look at dirt, and you see this mass of unreactive stuff. And then you look at vegetables, vegetative life, and it lives, it moves to a small degree, it has nutrition and grows and reproduces. You can see animal life, which has an additional kind of sensitive soul component. It reacts to stimuli, it interacts with other animals. There's greater and greater complexity. We add a whole new balance to the equation, to the point where when God looks upon creation with man populating the earth, he says, and behold, he saw that it was very good. Up until that point, every other created order was just good. With man and, and, and woman created, creation is now very good. So with that in mind, What's the gap, though, between man and God? We're animals. We sleep. We eat. We go through various limitations on account of how we think, right? We think by interacting with matter and, and, and thinking it through and abstracting from our experience to come to immaterial principles. Isn't there this huge gap between the human experience and divine experience? And wouldn't angels perfectly fit that gap? These immaterial creatures that are rational, and so they reflect God's rationality, but they also reflect his immateriality. They reflect his power and, to a degree, his endurance. They're not eternal like him. They had to be created. And yet they're everlasting. Angels don't die. So angels reflect particular facets of God that are not contained in the rest of the created order. And it would be fitting for God, who creates through his will at the behest of his wisdom, it's logical and fitting for him to have a created order that reflects these dimensions of his activity. So, St. Thomas, in addressing this argument, writes, The perfection of the universe in resembling its creator, who is reason itself, requires that there should be intellectual creatures. 
Now, to understand cannot be the, the action of a body, nor of any corporeal power. Hence, the perfection of the universe requires the existence of an incorporeal creature. Now, this kind of jumps through a lot of suppositions. You know, you can, might be able to say, well, we have brains, and we think with our brains, and don't we... We, we, we reason based on our brains, yes, but we reason in a way that's imperfect. It doesn't fully capture the, the full dynamic of what we're dealing with. And even for us, the very basis of the, the soul, the immortality of the soul, is the fact that some part of our thought process is immaterial. That we think with the brain, but you need more than a brain to think. There's, in a sense, the, the, the soul, the animating principle that isn't material, and yet expresses itself, in our case, in our experience, through our material brain. Um, there's a whole bunch of other argument on that in anthropology, and we don't really have the time. <laughs> but just to say that angels don't think the same way we do, and we're going to get to that. They think on a very different register, and they're much closer to how God thinks of, of creation. They're not where he is, and they're closer to us than they are to him, but they are closer to him than we are on this, on this register. And so it's fitting that they fill out creation for all of this range of experience that the rest of creation can't provide. These immaterial intellects that can think with such alacrity, such speed, such readiness. The dumbest angel is smarter than Albert Einstein. It, 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 can, it can intuit and understand things on a level beyond what bodily creatures like us can. But back to Gregory, then. Because ultimately the main reason for the existence of angels is divine revelation is that they are protagonists and participants in the story of creation, in the story of our redemption. And so, to go back to what St. Gregory said, that angels are indeed messengers, and archangels are, and according to Gregory and most traditional Christian understandings, archangels are those angels who are entrusted with messages of great importance. So the archangels are given messages that touch on things of universal import, whereas Ordinary angels focus on more restrictive things. And so now, as we go through the rest of the spiritual creatures that the scriptures talk about, I just want to make it clear. Angel, as St. Gregory says, refers to a role. It refers to an office, not a nature. Um, and so there are various created spirits that are out there, and they go by different titles. But, colloquially, we say angels. And we say angels to refer to all the different choirs and hierarchies of angels. So I may fall into referring to all spiritual creatures as angels, but just understand what St. Gregory said, right? That angel means messenger, and that's the primary meaning of angel. And that we use that term as a catch-all for everything else, okay? Okay, I'll keep moving, because I'm sure you don't like to hear that 50 times over again. The scriptures allude to many different sorts of angels and their action in the judgment of the world, and the action of Christ, in in all sorts of ways. Christ himself, in his preaching, talks about the coming of the Son of Man with all his angels, who will judge. Okay, Mainly the Son of Man will judge. St. Paul in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, says that all thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers were made through Christ and for Christ. And it's often been said by several scholars that St. Paul is actually writing the letter to the Colossians over the question of these elemental or spiritual powers of the world, that they were tempted to direct attention to at the expense of Christ. And so Paul is saying this, St. Paul is saying this, to establish Christ's centrality in the order of spirits. Not that he's a created spirit, but that all created spirits minister to him. This is an argument you also see in the first chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21. Christ sits at God's right hand, above, far above, all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So Christ is pretty important to St. Paul, whether Ephesians or Colossians, and all the, other, all the other angels. Again, Christ is a messenger, but he's not a created angel. But all the angels who, who are majestic and powerful take second fiddle to him, whether in the act of creation, because Christ is the word through whom all things are made, including all the principalities and powers and thrones and dominions, but also that at the end of time, right, when the Son of Man comes with his angels, he's not going to be playing second fiddle there either. And that, as it says here in Ephesians, that Christ will sit at God's right hand above every other power and authority and rule and dominion and above every other name that is named. 
And we know this maybe, maybe you know this from Philippians, where every knee shall bend in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Every creature, every tongue proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay, but we get other other instances of, of, of named spirits. In Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah, when he's commissioned to be a prophet by God, he's commissioned and he sees a vision in the temple of the seraphim, six-winged. So let's take a look at what they say. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, as in each seraphim covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one seraphim called to the, to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. He's talking about the one sitting on the throne, not the seraphim shouting out and crying. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. There was on the altar of incense, this altar of incense inside the temple, which burned incense continually, it was a way to placate God. The understanding was that the sweet smell of the incense would cover the unworthiness of those ministering. And so this angel, in effect, is taking on this cultic role. He's, in effect, in effect uh, re reappropriating this coal from the worship of God and touching Isaiah's tongue with that coal, saying, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sins are forgiven. The idea then that Isaiah complains about his unclean lips and this coal which burns on the altar of incense for the forgiveness and covering of sin covers his sin of speech, covers his inability and, and uncleanness in the face of the divine. Okay, so we got, we got a whole bunch of, of ranks here, right? We have a whole bunch of titles, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, rulers, authorities, powers, dominions, seraphim, and now cherubim, Ezekiel chapter 10. This is a strange vision of the Lord accompanied by these cherubim who, well, let me, let, let them speak for themselves by Isaiah's pen. Then I looked, and behold, on the ferment that was over the heads of the cherubim, there appeared above them something like sapphire, in form resembling a throne. And he said to the man clothed in linen, that is, the man seated on the throne, go in among the whirling wheels underneath the cherubim, fill your hands with burning coals from between the cherubim, and scatter them over the city. And he went in before my eyes. Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the house when the man went in. This is Ezekiel chapter 10, by the way. When the man went in, and a cloud filled the inner court. And the glory of the Lord went up from the cherubim to the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the glory of God. So it's all these, this is God's train. In Isaiah, we heard about the seraphim who burn with ardent love for God. Here we have the cherubim who are the, going to be these strange creatures who accompany the Lord. I love Ezekiel's description of these cherubim, which you're about to see, because it's nothing we could have made up on our own. In fact, if you look at some stupid History Channel specials, they'll speculate that these are UFOs. But while I think that's an idiotic explanation, I think that spirit and wonderment in the face of this strange scene is certainly called for. So why don't we take a look? So there's a cloud, the court was full of the brightness of the glory of the Lord, and the sound of the wings of the cherubim were heard as far as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. So the cherubim sound like God. They sound so overwhelming in the face of a, of a mere man that he's overwhelmed at the prospect. He confuses it. He's ready to confuse it with God, though he sees the distinction. And when he commanded the man clothed in linen, take the fire from between the whirling wheels, from between the cherubim, again, these wheels of fire among the cherubim. Not exactly an explanation of, of your hallmark card cherub, these wheels of fire flying about. He went in and stood beside a wheel, and a cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubim to the fire that was between the cherubim, and took some of it and put it into the hands of the man clothed in linen, who took it and went out. The cherubim appeared to have the form of a human hand under their wings. And I looked, and behold, there were four wheels beside the cherubim, one beside each cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was like sparkling chrysolite. And as for their appearance, the four had the same likeness, as if a wheel within a wheel. 
When they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went, but in whatever direction the front wheel faced the others, followed without turning as they went. And their rims and their spokes and the wheels were full of eyes round about, the wheels that the four of them had. As for the wheels, they were called in my he hearing the whirling wheels, and every one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub, the second face the face of a man, the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. And the cherubim mounted up. These were the living creatures that I saw by the river Kabar. So we see here this strange manifestation of God's identity in the midst of his retinue, in the midst of these cherubim, who are beyond anything that captures human experience. And again, some of the language here reflects Babylonian or Persian ideas. But the scene is so strange, it goes beyond even them. And look up depictions of the cherubim. You know, you're all on your computer. Look it up now. You'll see that it's well worth <laughs> the time. Okay, so we've gone through here all nine hierarchies. You'd think, well, why have we been gone on for so long? Well, because of this, because we've gone through all of these different titles that are contained in Scripture. We've talked about how it's fitting to come to the conclusion on a natural level that angels exist, spiritual beings exist, and we've seen in the prophets and in St. Paul the various appellations that are given to these spiritual creatures. Okay? And so why don't we just take a moment to go through them line by line and, and point them out. And at this point, again, I was hoping for a visual element so I'm going to pull up close to your phone there, or to the phone that's recording this lecture, and I'm going to show you some pictures as I talk, because there's enough, you can, there's only so much of my beautiful face I expect you to take here. So let's see, this is like story time in grade school, okay? I hope you don't find it patronizing, though. Let's see how this goes. So, when we talk about the nine choirs of angels, we have to understand... Okay, everyone see a good look here? This is a depiction from the 15th century of the Assumption of the Blessed Mother. And you can see three distinct tiers of angels, can you not? Three distinct tiers surrounding the heavenly throne. Let me see if turning this off helps a bit. Does that... Uh, I'm trying. Okay, maybe that helps a little. There we go. So, three distinct tiers surrounding the heavenly throne up there. And but while you get a look at that, um, if you want to look up the picture yourself... It's called The Assumption of the Virgin by Botticini. Botticini. Okay. So the highest, we're going to go through the nine ranks from highest to lowest of these different job titles, okay? The seraphim, those that were depicted in Isaiah 6, are widely regarded to be the, the highest of the, the spiritual creatures. They're the closest to God. They reflect most immediately that highest attribute of God manifest in creation, namely his love. They're on fire with the love of God, and their very meaning, seraphim, seraph means to burn. They burn with love for God and for the created order. Okay? Classical art portrays them as entirely red and ablaze, usually depicted as having six wings but no faces, simply a sea or ring of flame around the Holy Trinity. Okay? And you can see them up here. Let's see if you, well, I can see them. Can you see up top there? That, well, well, that didn't help, did it? There we go. That might help a little more. You can see that that top ring is all red, and you see no faces, but, but wings wrap one in the other. That's the seraphim, and they burden with that ardent love. <clears throat> Let's keep going. They're, because of this love, they have the most perfect knowledge of God. So this is why they're the highest. They, they're the most in the loop, because they love the most. St. Jerome would say that not only do they love the most, they also inspire love in the lower ranks of angels. More on that in a bit. In the ancient form of the Roman Rite, you know, there's a prayer that the priest says before the gospel. It's been truncated since the 1960s, but it basically talks about the scene we heard about in Isaiah 6. That just as you, Lord, were pleased to cleanse Isaiah's lips with a coal... So be, clean, be pleased to cleanse my heart and my lips that I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel. That prayer is a very ancient prayer, and it's one that invites the priest to a greater love of the gospel he's about to proclaim. Now, um, then we have the cherubim. The cherubim are here up top. Let's see. They're in blue. Okay? They're going to be in blue on that. Again, the top ring, they're not red. They're blue. They're just below that. 
that top ring. You see? So the top ring's red. The second ring within that top ring is blue. So, again, maybe just look up the picture yourself. I apologize. Again, I tried to get this to work um, on the scene, but you get what you pay for. The cherubim are reminded or, or understood to have an intellectual knowledge. So the cherubim have a knowledge of the divine secrets and the causes of things. And their name refers to this sort of understanding, this wisdom, this cunning in the face of everything. And someone's calling me, but I will hang up on him. There we go. <laughs> um, the, the cherubim have this knowledge. And so the seraphs burn in love, but the cherubim are consumed in contemplation of the divine. Okay? And they reflect on the love that the seraphim manifest so ardently. And they reflect on the dynamics of God and man and of God's ultimate purposes in creation. And it's for this reason how high up they are that they were readily depicted in the old temple. You know, whether it was Moses building the tabernacle in the desert, much of the cloth depicted the cherubim. The Ark of the Covenant, mounted by two cherubim, which would be the throne, the seat of God's presence. Think back to what we heard in Ezekiel, right, with the cherubim, who supported the throne of God. That was what was in his train, this wisdom, this power. And again, this strangeness, right, these wheels within wheels, like the wheels of the head turning and contemplating the mysteries with such ardor. Again, because there are the glowing coals even here. Then the third down, they're also blue in this depiction, are from Botticini, um, Botticini's assumption, are the, are the thrones. And the thrones can be seen as the sort of stability. It's sort of their, they're the basis of how God executes his authority and mercy in a variety of situations. Just as a, 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 an earthly throne symbolizes the authority of a king, so these creatures, by their very existence, symbolize in their role and how they carry it out God's governance of the world. Not that God needs them and interacts with them out of need, but he does so out of fittingness and tasks them and delegates them with it. And so you might think this is a bit odd mm -hmm. to emphasize this, but one of the emphases of the ancient Christian artwork, you know, when we think of, say, an ancient Christian basilica, the earliest churches are patterned off of basilicas. And basilica is a fancy word for the king's house, the king's hall. It's a way of repurposing what was a basically an audience room for an important personage to receive suitors. Basically, when they built churches, they put Christ and the bishop at the center, and it was the people of God who came and clamored for divine action in the face of it. So the thrones then were often depicted in the back of the church around the bishop, not because the bishop is God, but because the, the back of the church, that apse toward the east, symbolizes God's judgment, just as it would have been the site of the emperor to sit in judgment over the court. So it becomes the site for God to exercise judgment. Okay? Now, this overall, so these first three, again, this top band, this top band up there, that's only the first three of the nine choirs, but they form their own hierarchy. And there are, in the traditional understanding, whether you look at Dionysius, who we'll go into in a minute, or St. Thomas Aquinas, there are three hierarchies, nine choirs, and each of the three hierarchies focuses on something in particular. The upper hierarchy focuses on the most universal things, love from the cherubim, wisdom from the cherubim, the stability and universality of divine governance that flows from this contemplation. The highest choirs of angels, this first hierarchy, are the most fundamental and universal, and we'll see the implications for that in a bit. But the second hierarchy, in a sense, receives what it can from the first and implements it in the world on a bigger scale. On a bigger scale than, than the third hierarchy will. So these are, these are, they often say that the first hierarchy doesn't really interact with the material world as much. They interact with God. They contemplate God and they transmit and radiate his love to the angels below. But the second hierarchy takes what they receive from the higher hierarchies and uses it to govern the world. This is what we call the second hierarchy, who love with a love they didn't derive fully on their own, though no angel loves entirely on his own. He needs the grace of God. But they love to, in a sense, 
in accord with the love that the, the seraphim burn with. They, they see and reciprocate the love that they witness in the higher angels. And so the cherubim, their understanding, helps inform the understanding of these lower angels. And so the, the thrones, too, show the basis by which all divine governance is to proceed. Okay? So then the top of the second ring are called the dominations. They have what's called great and universal stewardships. They have to deal generally with create, keeping the created order in, in proper balance and, and, and proportion. And so, say, when the fallen angels would attempt to, to violate it or overturn it or work against it, the, the dominations are there as the security and the surety and the guarantors that the created order holds sway as God would have it. The virtues, they are the second tier on this second ring of a hierarchy. Okay, so again, up here, it's a little harder to make them out in this vision, but they're there. The virtues, that's not the virtue in the sense of what we would say like a moral quality, like something good about you. A virtue in this case refers rather to the raw power over the physical universe. So the dominations refer to the whole created order in a universal way. The, the virtues refer and, and ensure causality and cosmic order on the material realm. So again, a lot, there's a lot of overlap here, and we'll see the significance of it in a bit. But just to say they're more particularly tasked in that way, according to the tradition. Then you have the lowest tier of this second tier, of this second hierarchy, who are the powers. And they're generally those that represent and battle against the powers of hell. So these other ones are the guarantors. They kind of keep the stability. Now we're beginning to engage with the lower orders and with material creation in a wider sway. So again, the higher up you are, the less you have to do with the lower. The lower down you go, the more you deal with the incidentals of life. And so with the powers who touch on these universal things like physical creation, they battle the most directly against anything hell might try. The higher powers guaranteeing it and securing it, but these lower, the, these higher orders like the virtues or the dominations guaranteeing and securing it, but the powers are the ones who actually engage with the demons directly. And then you have the third sphere, which concern, as the tradition says, God's plan for mankind. You have, in a sense, the idea of these three ranks in this final hierarchy who interact with us the most, and so we know the most about them. There are the principalities. So the principalities are called such because they coordinate the two lower, the angels and the archangels, to such an overwhelming and, and fitting degree that they have this kind of power. And let's pull them up here. Yeah, so these here with the red and black wings. Let's see if you can make that out. Up there. Those are the principalities. Then below them you have archangels, and then lastly, angels. And so the principalities touch on questions of national import. There are often angels for groups of people or civilizations or societies. We see this in the book of Daniel, where St. Michael is called the Prince of Israel, and he battles against the demonic prince of Persia. And so that's where we see how the angels on this tier coordinate and direct the actions of the lower angels on these bigger planes. That's what we're getting to here. Now the archangels, and you're getting a full talk on this from Father John Paul, so I will not steal his thunder. But how many archangels are there? Well, it depends on how you count. We have the names for three, right? St. Michael, St. Gabriel, St. Raphael. Those are the three that are named and who have a liturgical feast and liturgical observance. But in the book of Tobit, when Raphael talks to the hero of that story, Tobit, he says, I am one of the seven spirits who stand at the throne of God which suggests that there may be as many as seven. And there are some traditions in the Christian tradition, particularly among the Eastern Orthodox, who will name or attempt to name the other four. This doesn't have as much official sanction as the three, because these three are revealed in divine revelation. But when you think about it, these are those who are entrusted, as St. Gregory had said, with messages of great import. But they also are those who take into account 
these ideas of groups. Again, principalities have a more universal scope. Archangels can have a more particular scope. So think of when Gabriel, Saint Gabriel, Blessed Gabriel, appeared to Blessed Mary, entrusted with the most important message of history. A message that would have universal import, but in this particular time, it wasn't just a general directive to a whole society or culture or strategy. It was a message to be entrusted to one humble girl who was to become the queen of the angels because of who she was, whom she was to bear. And then lastly, you have the angels, okay? And they might be the lowest, but they engage with us in the most direct way. Each of us getting a guardian angel and none of us getting a hand-me-down guardian angel. Every angel is made for the soul, for the protection of the human being that he's entrusted to or to whom, who is entrusted to him. So you may be thinking at this point, let's, let's just go through a few more of these pictures because I, I want to make sure you get a sense of these nine choirs. So here we have um, an Eastern Orthodox portrayal. Let me, let me try to take this out a bit. That's making it too big. Come on, go the other way. Oh, well, you're going to have to scroll. This is an Eastern Orthodox icon of the nine choirs of angels. That's God up top depicted in his triune majesty. And then moving down, you have the flaming seraphim on this side, the cherubim and their, their rings and wings, the strange sight. Then, you know, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers going down. And then lastly, the angels and archangels shown here, you know, ordinary angels, archangels, and the principalities depicted below. So that's an orthodox icon. This is so unprofessional, but again, you get what you pay for. This is a um, this is an engraving I found from a missal. It's quite lovely. Um, it speaks of how there are so many higher ranks of angels, and yet it's Michael who bears Saint Michael who bears the the sign of the cross that depicts, defeats Satan. And so here too, you can see the seraphim and cherubim. And, and again, these are meant to be strange sights. Let them, let them weird you out a bit because they're meant to. This is one I really enjoy. You have a depiction here of the Blessed Trinity, right? The Blessed Trinity. Um, and you have also the, this highest tier of angels. So the cherubim, the seraphim, and the thrones are all depicted here. And then you have the descending ranks depicted below like that, which I find, again, to kind of capture the idea of this mediation and procession. Okay. Here's one from St. Hildegard of Bingen, who is a doctor of the church. She was recognized as such by Pope Benedict. She was a mystic and a great saint. And so here you have the, the seraphim who are that deep red in the center. You have the cherubim radiating out and each order sort of taking its own proportion from divinity. And I think this is something that's helpful to keep in mind, is that the different ranks and choirs do symbolize and, and do enjoy a closer or more distant relationship to God, each in proportion to its nature, to capture to capture the divine life and, and, and vision in its particular context. So the seraphim are just better at resembling God than the cherubim are. And so it is. You know, this is a depiction from the Divine Comedy, you know, Dante's masterwork. And this beautiful engraving captures the idea of how these hierarchies of angels, these three hierarchies of angels, symbolize the Trinity itself. They depict the action of the Divine Persons. So that's a beautiful engraving. If you just look up Dante, Divine Comedy, Heaven, you'll see that one. Well worth your time. So, that's enough pictures. Let's get back to the lecture for now. So, you may have the criticism, and it would be a good one, because if you don't make it, someone that you know and love will. Doesn't all of this seem a bit contrived? We have, I gave you most of the citations of angelic action in Scripture, apart from seeing angels, say, rescue Peter in prison, or, or the angel that, that strengthens Christ in the garden, or ministers to him in the wilderness when he's tempted by Satan. You know, we have these instances of angels acting, but in terms of titles, and descriptions, I gave you most of what we have. So doesn't it seem a bit contrived? How can we claim to know all this when our biblical record is relatively scant? Well, a lot of people point to a mystic called Pseudo-Dionysius. Now, he didn't go by Pseudo-Dionysius. His book went by and was ascribed to Dionysius the Areopagite, 
who, if you remember, Acts chapter 17, was uh, a convert that Paul won in Athens. Dionysius was believed to be this pagan who came to believe in Christ at Paul's preaching, and so this book attributed, the celestial hierarchy attributed to St. Dionysius, was believed to be an ancient, an exceedingly ancient text. Most scholars today will say that the book is actually from the 6th century, from about 550 AD, and that it was by a Syrian monk. But it's, it's still pretty ancient for our purposes, but it's not what it claimed to be. And don't let that scandalize you. That was a very common thing for people to do, to attribute works to people greater than themselves. And here in Dionysius, we have much of what I just talked about, with three hierarchies of nine choirs, three choirs in each hierarchy, and the greater angels illuminating and strengthening the lesser. So the idea that every angel, in a sense, reports and looks to greater angels for illumination and help, and there's a gradation of being, of, of relation, as we approach the highest angels, and by extension, God himself. This idea, though, of hierarchies and deference isn't just cooked up in the 6th century by this monk. You can see it alluded to in Jerome and Gregory the Great, whom I read from, and most particularly you see it in Cyril of Jerusalem, who was a patriarch of Jerusalem in the 4th century, who recounts one of the earliest Eucharistic prayers in the early 4th century. You know that part of the Mass where the priest will go, the Lord be with you, lift up your hearts, let us give thanks to the Lord our God, and then he has a long prayer, he says, before the Sanctus, the Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of Hosts. In the ancient and most ancient forms of the Eucharistic prayer, of that preface, it would end with all nine choirs of angels mentioned. And Cyril of Jerusalem, in the early 300s, right around the time Christianity becomes legal, recounts the same nine choirs that we talked about. So even if this stuff isn't entirely obvious in Scripture, it is exceedingly ancient. It is exceedingly ancient in the experience and the expression of prayer in the church. And prefaces still talk about it at the end. Therefore, with all the angels and saints, or therefore, with thrones and dominions, with all the powers of heaven, with angels and archangels, we sing alongside them our triumphal hymn of praise. The prefaces, these, these long poetic prayers that thank God for the mystery that we commemorate that day in the liturgy, almost always turn to the angels as accompanying our song, accompanying our prayer. And so it's quite interesting that as early as 300, as early as 350, we have the full list right there. This isn't something that's just cobbled together over centuries. It's right there. We then have this idea of these nine choirs, and the liturgy used to keep more of a sense of these different titles and roles. You know, the, litur the litany of the saints, which has the line, all you holy angels and archangels, also used to have the line, which isn't said as much anymore, but all you holy orders of blessed spirits to cover those who aren't angels and archangels. Now, why, why then so much complexity and, and confusion? And this is going to get to, we're going to move here from office, from title, to nature. Okay, we're finally getting to nature, and this is where we're going to wind down, I promise. Aquinas, when he talks about these hierarchies, and he basically says, there seems to be a lot of overlap. You know, to, to love God and to contemplate his truth seem, you know, they're different words, they're different sentences, but they seem to overlap a good deal. We, God willing, do a bit of both. So why separate them? Aquinas has a beautiful answer for this, and a very humble one, when he says, Now our, angel, our knowledge of the angels is imperfect, as Dionysius says, pseudo-Dionysius. Our knowledge is imperfect. Hence, we can only distinguish the angelic offices and orders in a general way, so as to place many angels in one order. But if we knew the offices and distinctions of the angels perfectly, we should know perfectly that each angel has his own office and his own order, among other things, and much more so than any star, though this be hidden from us. So, you might think that all this flowery talk about angels reflects our arrogance, that we're making up and attributing all these things to angels because we imagine them. And again, that's something that is well attested to in the human experience in various other places. But St. Thomas is saying here that there's a whole multitude of angels. You know, the, in, in Daniel and in various places, it talks about, about myriads upon myriads. That means tens of thousands upon tens of thousands. What's 10,000 times 10,000? It's a big number. I think it's 100 million. So... They're talking about a lot of different spirits here. 
And basically, rather than the idea that, well, we took the simple idea of angel and multiplied it into nine choirs, rather, there are just a kajillion angels. And these nine choirs are the best way that God could kind of simplify it to the point where we could understand it. That's basically the way to look at it. It's not that there's less here than meets the eye because we made a lot up. Rather, it's that there's so much more that meets the eye that this seems imperfect and flimsy because in comparison to the full richness of the reality, it kind of is. But that's because there's more here than we would be happy with, not less. So then we have these nine choirs as kind of a catch-all. And when we look at how St. Thomas understands the nature of angels, we'll see what we mean by that. Because St. Thomas reads Dionysius very closely. Dionysius the Areopagite, he did not know that he was a Syrian monk in the 6th century. He believed him to be St. Paul's disciple. But that doesn't mean that Dionysius the Areopagite was wrong. In fact, just about the entire Christian tradition takes his understanding of, of angels and works with it. So, in seeing these spiritual creatures, the first thing to understand is that they're immaterial. To be a spirit means to be not composed of matter. So, you know, we have bodies, we get tired, we can get hurt, we die, we get sick. Angels do not do this, right? Angels, or spirits, are immaterial. There's no electric wave they give off, unless they chose to manifest one, but that would not be coming from their nature. That would just be a choice they had in the created order to, to manifest. They don't have bodies, they don't have harps, they don't have wings, except in a symbolic sense, right? These things depict the attributes of these immaterial spirits. But here's an odd thing, right? Let's say you have three cats, right? Let's say you have three cats at home. How do you tell them apart? Well, you say they look different. One's big, one's small, one's brown, one's black, one's red. I can tell them apart pretty easily. Okay, fair. Those, those different material attributes differentiate your cats. But what if you had twins? What if you had twin cats? How do you tell them apart? Well, you say, you know, there are slight differences, right? Like one looks like this, one, one looks like that. What if they were perfect twins? What if they were absolutely perfect, to the point of being basically interchangeable? How do you tell them apart? Basically, you tell them apart, not because of how they look, but because you keep track of the stuff that they are. You know that this cat is here, and that cat's there, and even if you can't keep track of their names because they're that identical, you know that these are two different cats, because one has his catitude and his stuff over there, and one has his catitude and his stuff over there. This means that the matter of the cat, the, the very physical being of the cat as a corporeal creature, is what distinguishes one cat from the other. You see that cat, that lump sitting on a chair, and you say, that's one cat. And you look over there at that chair, and you see a lump of fur, that's a cat that's, that's you know, purring and, and, and breathing in and out. You say, that's another cat. The matter is what differentiates those otherwise identical cats. That's why you have two cats, and not just one cat, right? If you had a hologram cat, something that looked like a cat but wasn't, you'd put your fingers through that hair and it would pass right through, right? Hologram cat. It looks like a cat. It's not. It's, a, it's a, an illusion. Good luck. The matter, the stuff, the existence of the cat is what separates them, right? That's what shows that there's multiple cats. But again, angels aren't made of stuff. This is the problem. Angels aren't made of stuff. So how do you, how do you tell angels apart? Well, think back to the cat, right? You tell cats apart generally by the color they have, the size they have. You know, nowadays we know that they have a unique genetic makeup. But angels don't have any of these material qualities. They're totally immaterial. And so when we talk about how animals are a form and a matter, you have a soul and a body, right? You have the soul, but you also have a body that makes that particular cat that particular cat. Angels only have a form. And what Thomas Aquinas determines from this is that Every angel, then, is its own species. You can have multiple dogs because there are multiple dog bodies. You can have multiple instantiations of a dog. There are many different men and women in this society and in this world. And we know what they are. We know who they are. We know how to interact on the whole. We're trying to do better, but on the whole, we know how to interact. And we can tell them apart because you're not me and I'm not you. And you can tell because my body's over here and yours is over there on the other end of that screen. Fine. Great. Angels don't have that. And what that means is that each angel is absolutely unique. There's no such thing as classes of angels. And even these choirs, as St. Thomas Aquinas alluded to, are loose categories that basically capture some sweep of the individual offices that each has. And each has an individual office because it flows from his individual nature.
Now, that's a lot of words. I know that's a big word salad I said there. But what I'm saying, that is, when we think, say, of all the animals in the world, right, you might think there are several million cats, several million dogs, eight billion humans, however billion ants and mice and what have you. You know, each species is multiplied. But the angels have only one instance of each variety. Only one of that kind of angel exists with that configuration and that set of abilities. There's not two of them. There are no angel twins. Because there's no matter. They're pure forms. And once you have that form, that's the only one. There's nothing to differentiate it from another except for its unique configuration. So, this means that each one is a member of its own species, which is a deep point. Let's move on. They're intellectual. Now, unlike us, we tend to say, I guess in the technical term, that man is rational. And yeah, we don't always act rational, I know. But what, we learn from experience, right? Remember how I talked before of how we learn by seeing, smelling, tasting. We learn through our senses and we come to conclusions based on how we interact with the world. Angels don't need to do that. Angels don't need to run their hair, hand through cat hair to figure out how healthy this cat is. Angels have an ability to intuitively look and evaluate at what they're dealing with. Angels have an ability to look back on the first and fundamental truths, the things that we can only come to with a lot of study and labor, and even then we have an admixture of error. We have some mixture of confusion on our part. Angels can see to the depth of it through the light of God and the glory that they enjoy. They can see through it, and especially when they're weaker angels, through the illumination of the higher angels to kind of pick them up and bring them up to speed. So again, angels don't solve math problems by kind of thinking through their head and memorizing the times tables. They have a sense for the numbers themselves and know intuitively how the math works. Whereas we have to kind of learn how to process it through practice and habituation and coming to a strategy. Angels get right there. They get to the heart of the matter like that. That's why we would say they're intellectual and not rational. Okay. We also know that angels have a will. How do we know they have a will? Well, Aquinas has a very simple argument on this. Let's say you have a brain, right? Let's say we know, and we know angels are intellectual, right? That's the very reason they exist. They are incorporeal intellectual creatures. But an intellect has to choose what it thinks about. So in order to choose what you think about, in order to consider things, in order to think of one thing and not another, you need a will to direct that intellect. You need a will to shape that intellect and come to the conclusion or consideration that you're looking for. So we know that angels have intellects and so they must have wills to help them choose how to think and what to think of. Angels are able to move instantaneously but not through space. They can move from one point to another at will because they're not material. They're not bound by our considerations of space and time. But they cannot be in more than one place at a time because again they direct their simple intellect to a particular place or time or experience. They, they apply themselves with a particularity but with this agility, this ability to move from one to the other without any sort of a, an intermediate point. And so they're limited to action in a particular place, unlike God, who sustains all things in being in all places and times. And they're incorruptible. Angels don't die, they don't rot, they don't get old, because they don't have bodies. They don't have matter that kind of breaks down. They're incorruptible forms. But they're not eternal forms. They were created just as we were, though created, of course, as immaterial beings. So... It's a kind of different creation that we don't fully wrap our minds around. So they're everlasting, they won't die, but they're not eternal. And they could have not been. Okay? And so remember now, moving on then. There's another understanding that St. Thomas gets from the choirs of angels and from Pseudo-Dionysius. That although every angel is his own species, they're on this gradation of being. So there is a spectrum going from the lowest angel to the highest angel, and there is a sense in Dionysius' understanding, and it's something St. Thomas Aqu Aquinas accepts, and it's something the Christian tradition has never taken issue with, is that, again, the higher angels communicate to the lower angels, and they do so in orderly ways, in accord with how they relate to one another. And so there is, between these angels, each one unique, a there's a reciprocity and an ordering in every respect. And so... You got that. The highest member in one class of angel would be adjacent then to the lowest member of the next class, right? You know, you have the A student in the remedial class and the F student or the C student 
in the intermediate class. This is a bad analogy, but you kind of see what I'm saying? They, they're basically ready to relate to each other. And so it is with the angels. If, if, if things are right in that classroom, they're ready to relate to each other. And with the angels, who are a perfectly ordered society, they're ready to relate one choir to another in the proper mode. Now remember, angels don't learn by seeing things. They learn by intuition, by peering into the very depths of what causes something. And so, in a sense, angels don't need to be informed about material facts the way we do. You know, they don't need to run an experiment to see how the chemistry works. They can look at the way the thing is and know from the principles how it will react. And so that means that lower angels can't communicate any new information to higher angels, nor can we. We can't bring anything new other than our experiences, our experiential knowledge. But we can't say to an angel, hey, did you know this stat about this baseball player? Now, they might not have that understanding of a baseball player ready at hand, but you, you direct them, say, to that particular effect, and they'd be able to access it for themselves in the light of God, whom they know. But the greater angels, because they see things more deeply and more accurately, they can inform and strengthen and enlighten the lower angels. And when we pray, and when our guardian angels help us, that's much what they do for us. That just as the higher angels look out for the lower angels, so the lower angels, who are the bottom of the totem pole and who have um, babysitting duty for us, they look out for us. So what does all this mean? Well, it means that angels are saints. We, we often forget this because we say, you know, I confess to thus and Mary ever virgin and all the angels and saints. We put angels in a class of their own. But angels are holy. They are the holy angels, other than the ones who rebelled. The ones who remain true to God are holy angels. And they are as much in heaven as any of the human saints who are there. And arguably, they're more in love with God than we are right now. And so they are part of the church triumphant. They are examples and, and even brothers in arms in the face of what we hope to accomplish. And because they're saints, we know that they merited. They merited entrance into eternal life. They weren't created in heaven. They were created with the ability to choose God or choose to rebel. We know what Satan chose, and we know what the good angels chose. And on the whole, the, the general idea is that two-thirds were loyal and one-third rebelled. That's the general idea. These angels, kind of like Adam, Adam was created in grace, not in the grace of, of eternal life, but he was created in grace to be able to know and love God as a friend. So the angels were likely, we don't know for sure, but most doctors will say the, the angels were likely created in grace, and given enough grace to be able to choose to cooperate with God. And those who chose to go beyond their own power and cooperate with God's plan and illumination and light merited eternal life. They merited the vision of God. And those who rejected that, because it would have been quite a difficult thing, because again, an angel acts so readily in every degree of his power, to ask him to accept grace that would extend his power is a new frontier for him. And some rejected and turned away from that and attempted, as some attempt to describe Satan's fall, as trying to rise by his own power. So, you'll probably hear more about that about demons with Father Joachim next week. But this stretch that each angel has gone through is an instantaneous choice between eternal life and, and, and damnation. And kind of like us, as we live our Christian lives, though we don't do it with the same sort of certainty or direct intentionality, we waver, we go back and forth, we take two steps forward and go one step back. The angels went from grace to eternal life like this, with a choice. We take a lot longer. And so when we, we see this, well, you could ask, well, if they can change so quickly, why can't the bad angels repent? Why can't the good angels fall away? Well, the good angels see God for who he is, and so they know there's no point to rebelling, and they know that his vision of him is worth more than anything that anyone else could offer. And as for the bad angels, why they can't repent, in, in choosing to rebel, again, they had a sense, they knew enough to know that God was the cause of their goodness. They knew enough to know that this grace was on offer to help them expand beyond their abilities. But they chose to reject that in an effort to seek an excellence on their own terms. And because angels think so intuitively, and they don't think the way we do in a more tentative way, this was a permanent change on their part. It's something that they are fixed in by their own choice, knowing it was their own choice, thinking that it would be enough for them to satisfy them. So 
their repentance isn't even just impossible, it's inconceivable, given the terms of what they are and how they act. They're not capable of it. And so angels are saints, as I said before, and they share a lot with us. They love us, they pray for our good, they're powerful, they act for our benefit. From highest to lowest, whether the seraphim contemplating God, their love enkindles in the lower angels and extends down to us, just as we love God and love our neighbor for God's sake. So the angels and their dynamic hierarchy act for our benefit, even the highest ones. They enlighten and strengthen us in ways similar to the way that greater angels strengthen the lesser ones. So just as a greater angel helps a lesser angel understand difficult concepts that might be beyond its power on its own, so angels can help us understand. And it might well be worth praying to your guardian angel when you struggle to understand something intellectually or morally, because they do it for each other. Angels help us from without. God's grace, on the other hand, wells up from within. As Christ says, it's the Spirit of God welling up into eternal life. Whereas the angels, of course, cannot act within us without our consent and cooperation. And the demons, of course, cannot, except from some very extreme and out-of-the-ordinary circumstances. But generally, you don't want to, to go there. And lastly, they teach us how to pray. And that's why the last talk, which I'll be giving, is on the angels in the liturgy, which is a wonderful... Um, reflection on how the pr angels' prayers have informed our own. St. Paul, when he was scandalized at Christians fighting each other in pagan courts, promises that we will judge angels. And presumably this means that we ourselves will be able to appraise and be thankful for the angels in their service to us as they act for our salvation and benefit. But there's also the custom of being united with the Son of Man and his angels who come with him, so not only will we judge angels, but we'll also take our place among them. Dante portrays this beautifully in the Divine Comedy. Remember that engraving with the rings of angels depicting the Trinity? Each of us, if we're meant for eternal life and God willing, God intends nothing less, and he certainly does from the outset, we will take our place among them as fellow citizens of the heavenly city, participating in the knowledge and love that each of them enjoy, and each of us in our proper order, in our proper place, based on the measure of our charity, the greatest of us ascending to the highest ranks of the seraphim. So maybe schmucks like me, lucky to, to get in the first tier at all. And we see this even in the lives of the saints, whether it's when Francis, St. Francis, at the end of his life, receives the stigmata, the stigmata on his hands, right, bearing the marks of the wound of Christ, who gives it to him? A seraph servant. He's inspired to burn with love for God, and bears the wounds of God in his own body. And so he identifies more closely with the angels in that experience. St. Dominic, who in the very canonization documents was portrayed as a wise cherubim. And of course, lastly, Our Lady, the queen of the angels, she who directs them and shows purpose. And so I don't want to close with any smart words or anything like that. I just want to close by looking back on an image I showed you before. See again this image of the choirs of angels, and see how it's not just the angels here. You'll see occasionally there's a soul or two here. There are Blessed Mother there beyond all the choirs of angels. We are meant to populate this heavenly kingdom. We are meant to populate and enjoy the heavenly Jerusalem with all the angels. And so we've been, we haven't been given an exhaustive knowledge of the angels by any means. We don't have every detail. And like St. Thomas Aquinas told us, right? We generalize them to nine choirs because we haven't been given leave to know more, and we barely have the capacity to know what we do know. But what we do know has been given to us for our benefit, that we might know of those who pray and intercede for us, who fight for us, and most importantly, whose faces do not turn from the Heavenly Father's face. So that's the end of my talk. If anyone has any particular questions, you're welcome to post them in this Facebook feed. I'll stay behind for five minutes. But barring that, many of you may want to call it a night, given how long I've gone. So with that, I'll just say, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. So feel free to stick around and ask a few questions if you would like, and I will field what I can. We'll see how that goes. It may be a couple minutes. Why are angels in art depicted as women? Okay, this is a good one. Why are angels in art depicted as women? Am I correct in um, assuming angels are male? What are cherubs? I don't like the way they look. If angels are fierce, they shouldn't be depicted as teenage boys. 
Are archangels fiercely looking in any art? Um, okay. Good, good stuff. A lot of great questions in this question. We'll go from the top. Why are angels in art depicted as women? Well, angels don't have a sex. Angels don't have a particular sex. And so that's, um, that's an artistic license. Because we don't always know, because we don't know what angels look like, sometimes they're made to look attractive. Um, and women tend to be attractive. So I think that might be part of the reason. Um, also, angels aren't male, though, either. Remember, they don't have bodies. We, we are male and female on account of our identity as, as rational animals, as, as the different sexes are made for each other. So we get our sex, our biological sex, from our bodiliness, from our biology. So angels do not have sex. What are cherubs? I don't like the way they should look. Oh, am I correct in assuming angels are male? Well, angels are often, they'll use the pronoun he with an angel, but there's no particular reason why it's one or the other. I think generally it's used with he because that's the way the grammar is in Greek and Hebrew. But they're not biological men, you know, and they're not male. They're masculine, if they're anything, they're masculine. What are cherubs? I don't like the way they look. Good. Good. You don't have to. <laughs> and the fact that you don't is a sign of the mystery and the weirdness of it. Right. If angels are fierce, they shouldn't be depicted as teenage boys. Fair. A lot of angelic depictions, again, are, are made to be a little more innocent or even infantile, right? Like the, the baby angels, to kind of show an innocence to them. It's a bit of an affectation. It's not strictly accurate. Um, are archangels fierce looking in any artwork? Yeah, plenty. Michael is depicted as a warrior. St. Michael is depicted as a warrior. And the others are are pretty tough too. Angels are very powerful. So making them look fierce looking helps to depict that power. But also they burn with love for us. So we need not work in that way. We worry too much there either. Angels being aliens. Angels drawn in ancient ruins. Well, various cultures have, an, have, have had understandings of incorporeal spirits. But I would be careful about just simply saying because a culture is imagined in an incorporeal spirit, that it must have been an angel. Now, quite frankly, angels could have worked in just about any culture or time. That's, that's their prerogative and God's prerogative in them. But I would be careful drawing conclusions. How do you find out about your guardian angel? Well, the place where we know about our guardian angel is from Christ, who says, Do not despise one of these little ones. See that he looks upon the face of my heavenly father. So each of us knows he has a guardian angel because Christ himself has said we do. Beyond that, we don't know a whole lot. I would caution you against, say, trying to name your angel. Some, some, there have been some movements in the past about that. In fact, I even named my angel at one point. But in a sense, it's disrespectful because you name a pet. You don't name some being that's superior to you in nature. It would be like you trying to name your wife or name your husband. It's not really your place to do. So with your angel, maybe you could say, hey, this is what I'll call you, but don't presume that's the angel's name. Okay, and I wouldn't ask for the angel's name. Okay, thank you for explaining the nine choirs. My pleasure. Drones and dominions, not drones. Fair enough. Yeah, okay. I, I did drone, huh? Okay, well, these are all the questions I got. If anyone else is hoping for one, it better come up in the next few minutes. Okay, someone's watching. Let's see. Hello? Hello, hello. Okay. Well, I don't see any more questions now, but feel free to message me or to, to look elsewhere. And um, yeah, be assured of my ongoing prayers. And I hope that as our masses begin to be open to the public next week, that I'll be seeing a lot more of you real soon. And in the meantime, through the intercession of the holy angels, may God, who will come to judge the world in fire with his holy angels, be pleased to pour forth his blessing on you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.